recently this morning after apparently they sense confusion so um, they're going to send me a list of you know things that have been completed next week um, and the deadline like I said the deadline was always going to be the end of finals week if if you have extenuating circumstances let me know and we can see what we can do um, but I'm I'm annoyed with them so just from the standpoint that they said well you know I should probably here let's pause okay now we'll turn it back, the recording back on all right um, so we have today and Friday in the full final in the last folder you should see some exam so sort of a practice problems for the final exam those ones I wrote by hand I this is my final exam that I've written. It's not ACS. Um, but if you're, you have those problems, you can go ahead and study with. You could also study in the library. There are some ACS study guides that have multiple choice questions. And of course, all the chapter ending, all the chapter end problems you have as review for all of the top hat through chapter 12 and also through chapter and through and 18. So you have plenty of multiple choice type problems that you could do, but mine are online first, and there's a good 60 or 70 of those. And the final exam, I think, is probably like 80 multiple choice questions. So, But it'll cover everything, so if you need to, you can work backwards. I'm trying. Well, I haven't started grading your exams yet, so don't ask me how you did, because it's five points better than before you asked me how you did. Um, but I haven't gotten a chance to start those because of some issues. So I'm hoping I can get those power graded by Friday so you can get them back. I will probably put the answer key up today. But don't freak out and don't start lobbying for points before I'm done grading them. Um, so, um, and then our final is next Wednesday, I believe. Same time, 1 o'clock here. Okay, so what we need to do is we need to sort of finish up talking about free radical halogenation. So I did put in the folder a graded, the last graded homework problem set for, this is one problem for Friday, and that's writing the mechanism of the free radical halogenation. So you can go ahead and print that out or however you want to um, do that problem, and I will collect that up on Friday. But what we have to talk about is we have to talk about how to determine major products of free radical halogenation reactions. So if I took something like this molecule and reacted it with Cl2 or Br2, I'm going to have two sets of conditions that I can do this. I can do this with at room temperature with light as my um, reactant. Or I can also do this greater than 300 degrees Celsius, which would be using heat. So there's really four sets of conditions here. Chlorination, bromination, at room temperature, or at greater than 300 degrees Celsius. Before we figure out what the major product of the reaction is, we need to figure out what all the possible products of reaction are. So remember, in free radical halogenation, I'm going to replace a hydrogen with a halogen. That's the ultimate um, reaction. So when I'm looking through this, I can go through and replace every hydrogen with a halogen. If that compound has a new name, it's a new product. If it has a name that's already of a product, then it's the same. So if I look at this, the first product I could write would be to attach the Cl to the CH2 of what I'm going to call carbon A. And also, I would get the same product if I replaced one of these, if I replace one of these CH3s or one of these CH3s, I will get one chloro, two methyl butane would be the compound that I get if I name it. So any six, any one of those six hydrogens on A carbons would give me product A. 
and this is the way I'm going to identify them. So then we would move to the to pro, to hydrogen B, and if I replace hydrogen B with a chlorine, that's going to give me product B. So that's the second possible product, and that would be 2-chloro-2-methyl butane. New name, new compound. Then I have two hydrogens here that I could replace. I'm going to call those C. And so that's going to lead me to product C, which would have a chlorine there. And then when we first start out, sometimes people will look at that CH3 and they'll say, well, that's going to give me the same, as pro same product as A. It won't. And the, way, the easy way to check that is just simply to make that molecule. That is now 1-chloro-3-methyl butane. And so those three hydrogens will give you the fourth possible product. So there are four possible products of this reaction, and what we have to do is figure out which one is the major product. The issue is the major product doing chlorination and bromination may not be the same. The major product at room temperature might not be the same as 300 degrees. So what's the major product? It's going to depend. And it's going to depend on what, what halogenation we're doing, as well as the conditions. And then, of course, there has to be a why to all of this. Why is that the case? So that's the tricky part of free radical halogenation. But the first step is always to identify how many different products we can get. Okay. So those are our four. I'm just replacing a hydrogen with a halogen. And then for all of these, plus HCl would be the other product. Okay. All right, so this is where we're at. Now, there are two things that go into determining the major product. And these two factors are going to fight each other. The first one is what I call statistics. The important rate determining step of this reaction is to have the Cl dot come in and remove a hydrogen from each of the carbons. And so I'm going to break the carbon-hydrogen bond and the chlorine is going to form HCl and I'm going to end up then with HCl plus I'm going to end up with my radical. And so this is the rate determining step of the free radical halogenation. And so this is the most important step. Wherever I form that radical, that's where the chlorine is going to add. So statistics means how many of the hydrogens could this Cl dot remove to make that product. Now this is new. We have never done this before. We have never talked about, oh, when I do this E2 reaction, the base has a choice of three different hydrogens that can be removed. We never, we said, okay, it's got three, so one of those three can rotate, but the number of hydrogens has never been in play in determining the major product. It's still not. Okay, so if you heard, oh wait, we should have been doing, no, you shouldn't have been doing that. This is the first time we're going to actually, the number of hydrogens is going to play a role in determining the major product. Before, it did not. Okay, so that's what statistics means. How many hydrogens would give me product A? Well, CH3, CH3, there are six hydrogens that would give me product A. How many would give me product B? One. How many for C? Well, that's replacement of the CH2, one of, one of CH2s, so that would be two H's, and then finally product D could come from any of the three hydrogens. 
So statistics just means, okay, which one of those is the greater number of hydrogens? Maybe that's the major product. Or maybe it's not. But in this reaction, because this rate determining step really does, is just a statistical issue of Cl dot removing a hydrogen, the number of hydrogens will always play a role. I cannot get rid of that. So how does it play a role? We'll get to that in a minute or two. But the number of hydrogens that give you that product always plays a role. So we can never get rid of statistics. Can we favor statistics? I'm certain we can't actually favor statistics. The other is selectivity. And unfortunately, selectivity has to come after we've talked about regio and stereo selectivity it sort of does but doesn't mean the same thing. So on free radical halogenation, what selectivity means is something that we've seen before. If this is the rate determining step, formation of this radical, maybe the major product comes from the most stable radical. Right? We've done that. We've done that numerous times. You add an H plus to a double bond. Which carbon do you add to? The one that gives the more stable carbocation intermediate. You have a Br dot. You're adding it to double bond. In the free radical anti-Markovnikov addition, where do you add it to make the most stable radical? So this we've done. Right? This we've done. The major product comes from the most stable radical. That's selectivity. Can that be overcome? Yeah, but give me a few minutes. So we have these two things. Of course, if you're going to form the most stable radical, that's going to be a carbon that has fewer number of hydrogens. So by definition, these things are going to fight each other. The carbon with the most hydrogens will not form the most stable radical. Because right? what's the carbon with the most hydrogens? primary. What's the least stable radical? Primary. So these are going to be at each other. And so the only question is which one wins. Well, in order for us to know which one wins, we need to know for selectivity, how much faster do I form a tertiary radical versus forming a secondary versus forming a primary radical. And that's really what the selectivity means. How fast do we form that radical? Tertiary versus secondary versus primary. Okay. And that's not something that we can just figure out. We have to figure it out experimentally. But here's how we have to do it. So what people have done is they've taken, for instance, butane. And in butane, you've got CH3, CH2, CH2, and CH3. And we have two, two hydro sets of hydrogens that will give us product A, two sets of hydrogens that will give us product B. So if I'm going to chlorinate this at room temperature with light, and that's how we're going to start. If you're going to halogenate anything at room temperature, light breaks the halogen apart and starts the initiation process and starts the free radical chain mechanism. So I need, I need light at room temperature. I'm going to get two possible products. My two possible products will be one, two, three, four, one chlorobutane and two chlorobutane, product A and product B. Which one's going to be the major product? It's going to depend on the conditions. Is it room temperature or is it greater than 300 degrees? We'll come back to that. So what people did was they, they did a lot of free radical halogenations at room temperature. And what they can do is you can do this reaction and you can determine the percentage of A and the percentage of B simply by doing the reactions and uh, injecting the sample into a GC. 
That'll give you the percentage of A and B. So if we do this for a number of molecules, we can get the percentages of these reactions. But so what? Well, what they decided to do was set up an equation that said the percentage of compound A, well, what I want to know is I want to know what the ratio of compound A to B is. Or better yet, how about B to A? Now, if statistics was not an issue, then determining the percentage of B to A would tell me how much faster we formed a secondary radical versus how much slower we formed a primary radical. So if statistics were not an issue, I could just take the ratio of the two products and say, oh, that's how much faster we form secondary radicals versus primary radicals. But unfortunately, statistics have to be counted. So we do something really easy. We say, okay, how about I divide through for product B? Well, product B has so many number of hydrogens. And how about A? Well, A has so many numbers of hydrogens. So if I divide through by the number of hydrogens that give me that product, I should normalize this system and then be able to determine how much faster we form a secondary versus a primary radical. But I have to normalize it for the number of hydrogens because right now it's unequal. There are six primary hydrogens and only four secondary hydrogens. So if I do that, what I'm going to end up getting is I'm going to get, a, get the selectivity of forming the secondary radical, the ratio of forming that to the primary radical. I can't, get, I can't get individual rates, but I can get ratios of rates. And so that's what I'm getting. So when you do this equation and you do enough problems, what you end up with is you end up with basically the results that for chlorination at room temperature, the rate of forming a tertiary radical versus a secondary radical versus a primary radical is 5 to 3.4 to 1. And my numbers are, might be a little bit different than the books. But this is the, these are the ratios that you get if you do enough of these reactions and sort of average out the results. So these are what are called then the selectivities. So what does that mean? That means if you take out the statistics, you will form a tertiary radical in chlorination five times faster than a primary. And you'll form a secondary radical 3.4 times faster than a primary. And you'll form a, a secondary not quite twice as fast. Or sorry, a tertiary not quite fast, twice as fast as a secondary. Everything is always related down to the primary. And the primary is always given a relative rate of 1. So these selectivities then, once we have them, allow us to rearrange this equation up here and calculate the percentage of A and B. And all I need to know are these selectivity values and the number of hydrogens that give me that product. So if I rearrange this equation, the percentage of the product, whatever it is, is going to equal the selectivity is going to equal the selectivity of that product. What does that mean? That means what radical formed that product times the number of hydrogens in the reactant. Okay. So I can determine what the major product of this reaction is for chlorination simply by doing, doing this equation and calculating the percent, which isn't a real percent, it's a number. But I calculate the number for A and B, whichever one has the bigger number, that's the major product. So what would I do? 
Well, for product A, what kind of radical leads to product A? A primary one. So that selectivity is always one. How many hydrogens will give me product A? Well, there's three, six, so one times six hydrogens would give me a value of six. For product B, is that number greater, lower, or the same? Well, how many hydrogens give, or how, what's the selectivity? This is a secondary carbon, so selectivity is 3.4. Times how many hydrogens will give me product B? Four, so that's 13.6. So which one of those two has the higher number, B? So in chlorination at room temperature, I'm going to get product B is the major product. Now, do you have to memorize the selectivities? No, I will give them to you. Do you need to be able to count the number of hydrogens? Yes. Do you need to have basic, basic math skills? That would be helpful. Right. We really don't need a calculator for this stuff. Now, if we use these numbers, we could get rough estimates of what the percentages would be. So in other words, the percentage of product A would be 6 over 19.6, and the product of B would, or percentage of B would be 13.6 over 19.6. Right. So all I'm doing is dividing each number by the total, just like we did in GC. So my math is that's about one-third to two-thirds. So about one-third of the product is A and about two-thirds of the product is B. Right. If we needed to know percentages. And again, for each reaction, there's lots of complications to this. There's it's virtually impossible to just do mono chlorination. So there's probably going to be some di, tri, tetra, a bunch of chlorines going on this, going on that. But for the most part, this is how we can determine the major product, simply by doing this formula. We need to have these calculated, though. And people have done that, and there's tables of those. So that's how we determine what the major product is. But these are the selectivities just for chlorination. Because if I change the conditions, those selectivities have to be remeasured. So we'll do the same thing, same reaction. Only let's brominate it at room temperature. So we'll brominate it with room, at room temperature with light. I'm still going to get the same products, only now they're going to be one bromo and two bromobutane as products A and B. But in this case, I need to know what are the selectivities for bromination at room temperature, so people have gone through the same thing. So in terms of the selectivities for bromination, at room temperature, it turns out that tertiary, the rate of forming a tertiary radical to forming a primary, to secondary to primary, is 1700 to 80 to 1. I mean, that's a huge difference, which is going to lead to why. Is there a difference here? Because after all, aren't we forming the same secondary or tertiary or primary radical? And we are, but they give different selectivities. So in bromination, you form a tertiary radical 1,700 times faster than primary. And you form a secondary 80 times faster than primary. We can conclude then that basically the bromine is more selective than chlorination, but we'll have to we'll have to talk about that. 
So we can take these selectivities and calculate what this reaction would be. So for A, how many hydrogens did we have? Six. Now the selectivity for a primary hydrogen is, or for a primary radical, is still one. So this number is still six. How about the secondary? I've got four hydrogens. What's the selectivity now for a secondary? It's 80, so I've got 320. Is B still the major product? Yes. But now, if I look at the percentages, it's 6, 6 over 326, and this is 320 over 326. So that's about 98% give or take, and about 2% give or take. This is basically 1% of 30 of 326 is 3. So 6 is about 2%. The ability to do math in your head is a skill that is slowly but surely dying. If I give a 200 point exam back, people are running to their calculators to figure out what percentage they have, when all you have to do is divide by half. Or you end up with just outrageous numbers in a lab report and it's like, that's what my calculator told me. Your calculator failed, but you failed as well because so having the ability to do that is useful. But I digress. So, 2-bromobutane, far greater major product in bromination. Why? Because forming the radicals is more selective. There's a bigger difference between secondary, primary, and tertiary than there was with chlorination. Again, that begs the question, why? We'll get to that. So this is how we can calculate the percentages. So chlorination is different than bromination at room temperature. It turns out that one last set of conditions, if we go to greater than 300 degrees Celsius, the tertiary to secondary to primary ratio is one to one to one, which means that we form each radical at about the same rate. Again, why? We'll get to it, but that's what happens. Is that for chlorination and bromination? Yes. So this is for either bromination or chlorination. Um, I would throw in that the one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one is also for fluorination at room temperature, but normally we don't fluorinate things. From, from general chem, fluorine is the most reactive, yeah, it's most reactive thing on the periodic table, right? In terms of main group elements, it's the most electronegative, it's the most reactive. If you're going to get a noble gas to react, what is it reacting with most of the time? Fluorine. Right? So if you have xenon noble gas, you can make like xenon hexafluoride using fluorine gas. It takes something that reactive to get a noble gas to react. Um, fluorine, if you had fluorine gas, which would not be a good thing because it'll kill you, um, and it's hard to keep into a container because fluorine will destroy stainless steel. It'll destroy everything except Teflon. So it's a good thing that we had some Teflon lying around in the, in the Manhattan Project to be able to develop the nuclear weapons because they took the uranium ore, they converted it to uranium hexafluoride. That's how they separated out the isotopes. Oh, wait, there was no Teflon lying around at the time. It hadn't been invented because they had to invent Teflon to coat the inside of the stainless steel tanks in order to hold the xenon hexafluoride gas. So Teflon is a result of nuclear weapons program to contain fluorine gas. And Teflon is just a long chain of carbon atoms 
with flooring attached to it. And it's really unreactive and slippery. So I digress again. Fluorine plus hydrocarbon equals explosion, so we don't do fluorination. But if we were to do that, it would have a selectivity of 1 to 1 to 1 at room temperature. Everything else is 1 to 1 to 1 greater than 300 degrees Celsius. So if I come back over to my problem here, I have six hydrogens times one is six. Four hydrogens times one is four. Did I really need to do the math? No, I just needed to count up the number of hydrogens. So in this case, I would get a 60% A, 40% B. I completely changed the major product. But if I wanted to make one bromobutane, that's the best I could do is 60-40. Statistics always plays a role. So in this case, yeah, I could make the two bromo in 98% yield. But if my job was to make one bromo, the best I could do is 60%. Which means if I'm working for a company that's making six, that's selling one bromo, I better have a customer for the two bromo because I'm going to be making a lot of it. And if it's just waste, my company's going to be insolvent like the next day because we can't be having more waste than product we're selling. That's not good economics. So. Greater than 300 degrees Celsius is when statistics rule all by themselves. But every time you do the um, room temperature, the best you can do is bromine. So if you think about what happens with the numbers here, if you have a molecule with a tertiary position, the bromine's going there. That's where it's going. I don't need math to tell me that. Because basically... I would need 1,700 primary hydrogens to break even with a 1,700 selectivity. Yeah, that's not happening. I need 80 primary hydrogens to break even with a secondary position. That's not happening either. Now, if we go back to chlorination, though, on the other hand, is it possible to have five primary hydrogens for every one tertiary position? Two methyl groups, six. So whenever we're doing these kinds of problems for bromination, you can pretty much do that without the math. Chlorination, I do the math. Because with only 5 to 3.4 to 1, the numbers of hydrogens can easily outweigh the selectivity. So you have to do the numbers with chlorination at room temperature. And if you're just doing greater than 300 degrees Celsius, no problem, just count up the number of hydrogens the one that gives you the product, the most hydrogens, that's going to give you the major product. Okay. Right. Everybody kind of with me? So this is how we can predict the major product of the reaction is by knowing the selectivities, which I will give you, and then being able to determine primary, secondary, or tertiary carbons, and therefore the hydrogens. But this does leave, there, uh, there are some unanswered questions here. Like, why is bromination more selective than chlorination? Because if I'm taking a halogen and I'm reacting it in the rate determining step, as I had drawn before, to form HCl or HBr, and that radical, if I'm forming the same radical, why, is, why am I forming one faster than the other? They're the same radical. And more importantly, everything always boils down to an energy diagram. It's been a while since we've done an energy diagram. But if I'm going to do this energy diagram, my, let's say, my secondary radical is going to be at the same energy regardless of the reaction that I do. So what's different? 
Well, what's different is, and your book goes probably into great detail on this, that this step when you're doing bromination with a Br dot, that overall reaction is endothermic. And for chlorination, the reaction is exothermic. In other words, that step of the, that rate determining step. This is the rate, this is the rate determining step. And with bromine, it's endothermic. And with chlorine, it's exothermic. And the book will walk you, any book will walk you through the gory details of what it takes, what energy you're going to get in forming a bromine halogen versus a bromine hydro, or chlorine hydrogen bond. Breaking the CH bond is going to be the same amount of energy. And so it really boils down to how much energy is it going to take? How much energy am I going to get back when I form the bromine and, chl and chlorine hydrogen bond? But overall, that rate determining step is endo for bromine, chlorine, it's exo, which means that if I come over to my reaction coordinate diagram, my chlorine is going to be exo, so that's going to look like that. In other words, the reactant, the reactant side up here is going to be higher in energy than the product side because energy is given off. So that's, chlor that's the chlorine side. And then the bromine side, the reaction is endothermic. The radical energy is the same. It's the other stuff around it that, is changed, that has different energies. Now, if I said, which one of these reactions is going to be faster? Chlorination or bromination? I was going to say bromination just because it seems to have a lower energy. But does it? So let's so you so let's plot out the activation energy here. So these are my two activation energies. So yes, we do need to know what the activation energy is, and the activation energy is now. If when you're looking at this, I this this side is the reactants, and this side over here is the reactants. So I'm looking at chlorination going from left to right. I'm looking at bromination going from right to left. So yeah, it looks like the way I scaled it, if it was all one reaction, the first, re the first activation energy might be higher than the other one. But really what I'm looking at is I'm having both of these reactions come together in the middle. So this activation energy for bromination is much higher than chlorination. So which reaction is going to go faster? Chlorination. How do we know that? We have rate equals A E to the minus E A over R T. Arrhenius equation. So the Arrhenius equation will give you the relationship between activation energy and temperature that you learn in general chem. The only thing that I will comment on with the Arrhenius equation is that notice the EA and the temperature are superscripts off of E. So this is a logarithmic function. It is not a linear function. And so a little bit of change in activation energy or temperature is going to have a logarithmic effect on the rate. Okay. And so we're going to talk about small differences in activation energy creating tremendous rate differences. Right, 1,700 to 1 is big, but not in the logarithmic scale. In the logarithmic scale, 1,700 to 1 is kind of small. So that's where the logarithmic function comes into play with the Arrhenius equation. So chlorination is faster than bromination. 
great fact. What does that have to do with the difference between 1,700 to 1 and 5 to 1? Well, nothing directly, because now what I need to do is translate this into how much faster do we form a tertiary radical versus a primary radical in each case. Okay. All right. So, so far, if you accept this, which again, the book will go walk you through all the gory details of the energies, so it is a fact, then the chlorination will be, large, will be faster than bromination. But that doesn't tell us about the relative rates. So now what we need to do is this. We need to say, well, here's my primary radical and here's my tertiary radical that I'm forming as the product of the reaction, a product of that rate determining step. And to be honest, the, I've got the X dot chlorine bromine, the alkane, same alkane, I'm just removing diff, two different hydrogens. So for chlorination, they're going to stay, the reactants are going to basically have the same energy. So now we have to say, well, I'll draw a diagram going to the primary. What am I going to draw with that same diagram going to the tertiary? It's going to have a lower activation energy, right? So forming the tertiary radical is going to have a lower activation energy than forming the primary radical because the tertiary radical is more stable. That was Hammond's postulate. I think we talked about Hammond's postulate back when we talked about SN1 and why a tertiary radical would be formed faster than a primary radical, which is why SN1 goes fastest with tertiary radicals and, slowest with, and slower with secondary and doesn't occur at all with primary. So Hammond's postulate means that if you have a piece of paper that if you lower the active, if you lower the energy of the product, so looking for a U, here's a thermoneutral reaction, same energy level for reactants and products. If I now make the reaction exothermic, what happened to the, the um, activation energy? It got smaller. What happened to the transition state? It moved more towards this. And Hammond said the transition state looks more like the reactants and the products. We interpret that by saying the more stable the product, the lower the activation energy. Okay. So why will I form a tertiary radical more faster than a primary one? Because the tertiary is more stable. Five times faster? That depends on the activation energy, the temperature, and the Arrhenius equation. You could go ahead and calculate all that. So, okay, again, nothing spectacular here. Draw the same thing for the bromination, but now the bromination is endothermic. Will I form a tertiary radical faster than a primary radical in an endothermic reaction? Sure. Because the tertiary radical is more stable, and Hammond's postulate would say it has a lower activation energy. So here's chlorination, here's bromination. But why 1700 to 1 versus 5 to 1? We could go through the gory math of this. It would, you know, nobody wants to do that. Just a simple mentioning of the gory math. I and mean, a number is probably going to zone people out. You're already in the last week, so if you're not zoned out already, good. If you are, you're not listening anyway, so it doesn't matter. 
even people watch, listening to this because you're not in class today. Shame again. Um, so let's talk, well, let's talk about the energy issue. What energy issue? How do molecules overcome these barriers? Thermal energy that comes with temperature. So at room temperature, we have a finite amount of energy. For chlorination, I have a much smaller activation energy than for bromination because it's exothermic. That means the energy differences between primary and tertiary activation energies are going to be smaller, relatively speaking, than they are with an endothermic reaction. So we can talk about birds or hikers. Birds are more fun. So a bird is, you know, at room temperature, got a good amount of energy, not near death, which, I'll get, which we'll get to as the other example. Or hypersonic is just normal bird, got a good amount of energy. It's looking out. It sees two small mountains. It's going to go over the smaller mountain faster, but it can still go over the other mountain almost as fast. Five to one ratio. Bird, moderate energy, is going to struggle a little bit more, sees bigger mountains, big mountain, even bigger mountain. Going to struggle getting over those. So it's now going to go over the smaller, bigger mountain, 1,700 times faster than the bigger, bigger mountain. Right? So because the reaction is exothermic, or sorry, because it's exothermic, the activation energy difference is smaller. Because this is endothermic, the activation energy difference is a little bit bigger. Now remember, this was all logarithmic. So 1,700 to 1 and 5 to 1 isn't that big of a difference when we're talking logarithms. So birds are going to take, they're going to be going over the big mountains a little much more at a different rate than going over the small mountains. Okay. So that's at room temperature. All right, you know, we can get the birds near death. They have very little energy. Usually it's the hikers near death. But we, if we get the birds having less and less energy, what's going to happen? Those selectivities are going to get bigger and bigger. Now, so we could have a chlorination at 10 to 1. We just have to lower the temperature. right? The less energy the molecules have, the more they're going to go over the barriers at a bigger difference in rate. But you have to be careful because if you lower the temperature too much, the reaction isn't going to go. So there's only a certain amount of selectivity you can get out of this before no reaction. On the other end is hypersonic birds. Right? They won't be wearing the little Texas hats that the pigeons are wearing down. Somebody's putting Texas, putting uh, cowboy hats on pigeons in one of the cities. It's, called, it's national news. How they're getting that to happen is the mystery. Or maybe they're doing it, them, the pigeons are doing it themselves. Hypersonic birds. Hypersonic birds, what barrier? Right? If, you're, if you have lots of energy, like you have it greater than 300 degrees Celsius, I can go over either barrier just as fast. What happens to the selectivities? One to one to one. So the reason that the selectivities are changing, <coughs> chlorination, bromination, exothermic, endothermic, temperature, give the molecules more energy, those selectivities are going to go down until they become approximately one to one to one. Okay. All right, so um, on Friday, if you have questions, we will go over, uh, bring them to class, put them on Piazza until Friday. I'll answer them. Um, but we'll, and we can finish this up. Maybe we'll do a couple problems here so that we understand that. Friday, the uh, mechanism is due and it's in the folder on Canvas. It's in today's folder. I put it in there this morning.